Let's pray again really quickly. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. Again, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here today. We thank you for that lovely song and, um, and the leadership we received to, to sing that as a prayer unto you. I pray, dear God, that uh, you would use that song, our time in your presence already, to prepare us today to have ears to hear and the ability to see and to perceive what you have to say to us through your word today. I pray, dear God, that it wouldn't simply be an intellectual exercise today. I pray that it would be a spiritual exercise, uh, that your word would pierce our hearts and that it would infuse our spirit. Lord, I pray that when we hear things that maybe we have a visceral reaction against, I pray that you would give us the measured ability to take it in, to consider it, to prayerfully consider it later, perhaps, if we should, and to come to the right conclusion on the things that are said today from your word and beyond. Uh, by Pastor Brian. Lord, I surrender myself to you, my ideas to you, my opinions to you, and I simply pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done, that your word would be taught today in a way that is accurate and effective uh, with the right tone uh, for your precious people. Lord, I don't uh, actually play today for the audience that is my congregation. I serve them through preaching your word, but I play before you, the audience, the one. And so I pray that uh, what I say and the heart I say it with today would be pleasing to you, and you would produce the results through it that you choose. We love you, Lord. We thank you again for this sacred moment. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to go with some pastors um, down to Washington, D.C., and go on a kind of a semi-private tour of the Capitol in Washington, D.C., the big Capitol there. And one of the coolest things to me about the tour, I mean, we got to go to the Senate and the House and all of that, and there were many things that were interesting. But one of the coolest things to me was that every state in the United States, all 50 states, are given the opportunity to put two statues, so 100 total statues, in the Capitol from uh, famous, infamous, important historical figures from their state. And so I'm from Georgia, and I saw the statue uh, for Crawford Long, who was a doctor from Georgia who um, did a lot for the rural poor there. There was a guy named Alexander Hamilton Stevens, who was friends with Abraham Lincoln, one of the few Southern politicians in that era that was friends with Abraham Lincoln. Um, from California, we have Father Unibro Serra, the guy who established Monterey, Mo Mountain of the King, and many other missions along the coast in California, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan statue in the, uh, is there. Um, interestingly, from Virginia, Robert E. Lee, he's still there. He's still making his stand. I don't know how long he's going to last, but he's still there. And, of course, George Washington. But the one that really got me was a statue from Pennsylvania of a pastor or a priest from Virginia. His name was uh, Peter Mullenberg. And he, uh, he had a church. He was the pastor or the priest of an Anglican or Episcopal church in Woodstock, Virginia, just before the time of the American Revolution. And he was getting very provoked by the circumstances, the tyranny coming from England. He was very concerned about the state of America as a colony. He was beginning to have kind of revolutionary-type vibes. And, and I think he was struggling... Uh, with his citizenship as an American and his citizenship in the kingdom of heaven at the same time. He was struggling with this seemingly dual um, calling on his life, one to be a pastor, to be a priest, to be a preacher, and then the other to be, you know, a patriot and to fight uh, for the independence of America. And so I think he struggled with that for some time and he kept a foot in both camps for some time. And then eventually, uh, on January 21st, 1776, just before the Revolutionary War really broke out, uh, he came to his church one day. He stood before his congregation the way I stand before you today. He didn't, I don't think they had internet back in the time, so it was just his live audience. And he read from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. His sermon was from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I'll just read that section today. I'm not going to preach from it. But this is the section he was in, and then I'm going to tell you what he said just after he read this. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, it says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, under the heavens. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. 
There's a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And as he finished this section, he looked at his congregation and he said, you know what, there's a time to preach and there's a time to fight. And so standing before his congregation, he took his clerical robes and he pulled them back and he unveiled the fact that he was wearing uh, an officer's uniform from the Continental Army. And he took off his robes and he revealed his uniform and then he walked down the center aisle of the church. The men in the church kissed their wives goodbye, filed in behind him. The next day, he and 300 men from his community uh, joined up with George Washington in the 8th Virginia Regiment to begin to prepare uh, for the American Revolution. Now, I was uh, standing in the crypt, which is the basement of the rotunda, right outside of the tomb of George Washington. George Washington isn't in the tomb, but the tomb for George Washington was placed there. He refused to be buried there. So, but it's there. It's kind of an ominous and kind of a creepy place right under the rotunda. It's the place where presidents stand uh, just before they go upstairs to be inaugurated, or, you know, not yet presidents stand just before they go upstairs to be inaugurated. So I'm in the crypt. I'm near the tomb of George Washington. I'm looking at this statue. The statue depicts him pulling back the robe and seeing the uniform. And I'm standing there with a bunch of pastors. And we're kind of in that moment. And I'm kind of thinking to myself, you know, what if I was ever in those circumstances? What if my role as an American citizen, as a patriot, as someone who loves his country who has grandparents and many, you know, ancestors who have fought for and died for the freedom that I preach under. Uh, what if I was in some similar circumstances and I had to decide, am I an American citizen or am I a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? How do those two things contrast with each other and how do those two things seemingly connect? And I thought about it and it kind of haunted me a little bit because I've never been very political. I've never been in the military. I'm not, uh, I've never worked for the government. I've never been in that sector. A lot of us here in Virginia are. Some of us in California are. My friends back in Georgia, we don't even think about the government other than in negative terms. But I thought about that. I'm like, what would I do if I was in the same situation that he's in? And it kind of bothered me because I wondered if that day would ever come. I wondered if I was having that moment for a reason. And, and I do believe fast forwarding to today that we are in a similar place but instead of standing before you and saying I feel like there's a time to preach and a time to fight I feel like what the Lord has shown me is it's time to fight by preaching it's time to stand before my church and whoever else wants to listen and to look at where we are as a nation politically and otherwise through the lens of scripture and tell the truth. As the Apostle Paul said, and we were in this verse just recently, maybe a couple weeks ago, the weapons we fight with as apostles and pastors and Christians, the priesthood of all believers, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. Our resistance is nonviolent, it's spiritual, and it's based on the Word of God, the authority of God, which usurps the authority of men. On the contrary, they have, our words have, when they are God's words, divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension and even political agendas that set themselves up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Since uh, this election began, I would say over the last year, but especially since the election itself finished in the last few weeks, couple weeks, I've spent more time on the phone talking with people from our church, past and present, about this election, about the agenda, about what's happening in this country than ever before. And unlike times in the past where I feel like we're just talking about it, maybe gossiping about it, I feel like the gravity of our conversations and our thoughts and our reaction are more important than ever. We just elected, or seemingly elected, we'll see what happens when the votes are truly counted, an an administration who has an agenda 
that is overtly, not just ungodly, but anti-godly, not just unchristian, but anti-Christian, it is the agenda of the Antichrist, and I'm convinced of it. And I really don't want to do that today, okay? I'm going to preach it, but I don't, want this, I don't want this to be the nature of our conversation. I want us to be calm and enough to be focused. Because there's a lot of people we love all around us, Tom, who don't understand this. And so we want them to understand, and we don't want this to be a Trump rally, right? We want this to be a time in church where we look intently into God's Word and into our heart and examine every pretension, every idea, and hold every thought captive and make sure we're in alignment with the will of God. That's what I want this to be today. So there's this agenda out there, and if you think I say these words flippantly, you're crazy. If you think I'm a pastor who gets excited about preaching a political agenda, you're crazy. If you've followed my career over 14 years, which nobody has because only my wife has been here the whole time, and she'll be the only one here at the end of time, and she might be the only one here next week, I never talk about politics. It's just not in my nature. Some of the things I'm bringing up to you today are not deep convictions. They're recent convictions for me that God has brought to me. But the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, and He knows what's important, and He directs my action. He causes us to will and act according to His good purposes. And as a pastor, He causes me to will and act according to His agenda and not the agenda of my own. When Barack Obama won the first time, I had a bunch of people in the church in California. California, if you're here today, God bless you. And they were really upset that Barack Obama won and his agenda took place. And I stood before the congregation. I told them to chill out. That God was sovereign. Christ was still on the throne. We should pray for our president. Pray that he does the right thing. Pray that God corrects him when he does the wrong thing. Pray that God thwarts him when he tries to do the wrong thing. And by the way, the other guy that we were thinking about electing, I'm not so sure he was any good either. I thought it was phenomenal that we elected our first black president. I wanted to focus on that more than the negative things. And at that time, I felt like that's what God had to say to us. I felt like that again when he won re-election. And if Barack, uh, if, Biden, if, Barack Biden, if Biden wins the election this time, I'll say something similar in regard to him. At the end of the day, Christ sits on the throne and nothing happens apart from his sovereign control. So we would say that again. Yet at the same time, I must say that the agenda of the left has always been like this, but is more overtly anti-Christian than ever before. By the way, just to put it on the record, I didn't vote for Donald Trump in 2016. I didn't trust him. I didn't trust his character. I didn't trust his promises. I did vote for him. I will put it on the record in 2020 because I saw what he did. I looked past the rhetoric and past the hype and I looked at the substance, and on all the issues that I'm going to talk about today and many others, he aligned himself with what we believe. So I voted for him. Does that mean he will never betray me? No. Does that mean I'm trying to stand here and get you to vote for him? No, you can't. The election's over. This is just us talking about the national agenda and the things that are going on. And I have to tell you, I have to tell the truth. I have to compare their agenda to the Word of God, show the de deviance, the uh, way it deviates from the truth and the knowledge of God and call us to repent if we support that and call us to repent if we've been apathetic about that and allow this agenda to come forth on our watch. Now, my attention was, in reaction to all of this, to preach a sermon from Jeremiah 29. And it, in Jeremiah 29, the prophet Jeremiah speaks to the Hebrew people who have been taken into captivity into ba Babylon and he teaches them how to function in Babylon, waiting for the day that the Messiah would come and deliver them from that place. I was going to come before you, and I was going to say, hey, we're in Babylon now. We're in there, and we're like the Hebrew people, and here's how we should live during a lawless time as God's people in the world, but not of it. But as I was beginning to write that, I felt like the Holy Spirit got a hold of me and said, if America becomes fully Babylon, and no question the spirit of Babylon is here, but if America becomes fully Babylon, then it's your fault. And he reminded me what Paul said in Thessalonians, which is that during this time when the Antichrist is going to come on the scene, before he can come on the scene, it seems to me that the church must be removed because there's a restrainer, which I think is the Holy Spirit that exists inside of us, restraining evil until it's time. And so I feel like the Lord was saying, the Hebrew people, 
back in the day were taken into captivity and that was the way it was and it wasn't going to change until Christ returned but you don't live in Israel and you haven't literally been taken into Babylon and this is not that time and these are not the, those circumstances that is not the appropriate message for your people yet yes the spirit of Babylon has been unleashed but yes the Holy Spirit still exists inside of you and yes you can still resist not out of fear not being frantic not demanding we win, but with a silent confidence that Christ is on the throne. So I feel like what God wants me to do today is to begin to expose this political agenda, which I don't think is conceived from the hearts of men, but is conceived from Satan himself. I know those are heavy words, but that's the way I feel. The first thing I want to talk about is their agenda with Israel. They have an agenda that concerns Israel. And the agenda is to delegitimize Israel, to delegitimize that they uh, have a right to that land and specifically have a right to Jerusalem. There's an agenda to do that. Donald Trump did something that was absolutely um, unprecedented in American history. I'm so tired of using that word, but it was. And he recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital, and he moved our embassy there to affirm it. The, the legitimization of Israel by American presidents has always meant everything. In 1948, when Ben-Gurion declared Israel as a state again in the Middle East with the UN's covering, the first thing the President of the United States did, President Harry Truman did, is he legitimized that. He affirmed that. And it made it stand. It matters. America is the most powerful country in the world economically and militarily and politically, even in, you know, our fragile state that we exist right now, we have that kind of power, we have that kind of clout on the world stage. When you're given that kind of power, you're given that kind of responsibility, and you and I are citizens of that country with a bit of political power on our own through our uh, elections and our influence and our freedom of speech and other things. And so what our government does, they do as our representative... And it's an indication of where our hearts are. So there's this agenda to delegitimize Israel when we should be legitimizing Israel. And why should we be legitimizing Israel? Because God's word legitimizes Israel. No one gave them that land. God gave them that land. And even now, since 1948, their presence on that land is in fulfillment of prophecies in Scripture under the authority of God. One of the very first times uh, this was affirmed is in Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, the Lord speaking to Abraham, a direct conversation, is recorded as this. Genesis 12, uh, beginning in verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And then he goes on to say, after giving him the land, promising the, him the land, he goes on to say, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. That is, that is a promise from God that stands to this day and includes us. And oh, by the way, and all the people on earth will be blessed through you. Now, Abraham is the father of many nations. In one place, he went from being named Abraham, Abram to Abraham, and the Lord said, your name is Abraham because you're the father of many nations. He didn't just have a son, Isaac, who had Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes that became Israel. And Isaac was the son born of a promise. And Isaac was the son who was circumcised. And that, that became the Jewish people. He was also the father of Ishmael and all of his descendants. And so uh, Abraham is, in a sense, the father of us all. And, and basically, the Lord is saying, look, you and your son Isaac through whom I'm making the promise. You're going to go to this land, which is at the crossroads of the ancient world. I'm going to establish you there. I'm going to bless you there. Those who bless you will be blessed. Those who curse you will be cursed. And you will stand there in a covenant with God, which eventually would come through Moses, through the law, the Ten Commandments, and beyond, and the prophets. And you will stand there as a, an exposition to the world, uh, the knowledge of and the salvation of God. And so the reason the Hebrew people 
have that land is because God gave them that land. They gave it, he gave it to them uh, under his authority for his purposes. And God put them there not just to bless them, but to bless the whole world through them. When we reject their place there, we reject God's authority there, and we reject the very plan God has given them for us for the salvation of the world. Even today, you may say, well, you know, we're past that. We're spiritual Israel. We're the church. Well, even today, if you go to the teaching of the Apostle Paul in the New Testament Scriptures, he said, no, 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 salvation is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Now, this whole thing of speaking up for Israel is r really counterintuitive to me. This is not something that comes to me naturally. I've been to Israel twice. The first time, I didn't even like it. And the second time, I had a more profound and, and better experience and and I began to understand. When I began to write this sermon, I was going to begin with the issue of life. And the Lord's like, no, you begin with the issue of Israel. This is his message. It's not mine. This is his word. It's not mine. Well, pastor, you're in church. You're not supposed to be talking about these issues in church. Why? What do we not talk about in church? Well, there's a separation of church and state. Well, I've read the whole Bible a lot of times, and that phrase does not exist there. You know what else I've read a lot of times? The Constitution. You know what doesn't exist there? That's that phrase. There's something in the Constitution that is called the, the Establishment Clause, which says that basically the federal government doesn't set up, doesn't fund the church, and doesn't control it. There's nothing that says that we can't talk about the affairs of our day, public and private, in light of God's Word, and go out with those convictions to participate in the political system that God has given us. As a matter of fact, not only do we have that right, we have that responsibility. Separation of church and state is a phrase that was used by Thomas Jefferson in some early writings as an idea. It was never anything that became law. Not only should we be talking about these things, we have to be talking about these things right now. They affect our life. If this nation is a blessing to Israel, then we will be blessed. And if we curse Israel, we will be cursed. To reject Israel is to reject God's plan of salvation. And guess what? Like it or not, Israel will be there. They will be there to receive the Messiah the second time. He will set up his throne on the Temple Mount, and he will rule the world, and it will be very, very good for those who stood with him and very, very bad for those who didn't. We absolutely should influence our political leaders, Republican or Democrat, to support the nation of Israel. Does that mean that they can get away with any crime? Absolutely not. But they have a legitimate claim to that land, to that nation, and to Jerusalem. And we should support that. Not because we like them more, but because we like them, and through them we know that salvation will come to us all, including to the Palestinians. That's just the first one. This is going to be fun, isn't it? Second thing on their agenda, life. They say their agenda is to protect the right for a woman to choose. This is a tough one. But their, in, their agenda includes funding, massive funding, unending funding for the abortion industry, and funding for a group called Planned Parenthood who doesn't just protect a woman's right to choose, but pushes and persuades and encourages women to choose abortion as an honorable solution to an unplanned pregnancy. And that's evil. And that's wrong. And they use this influence and they persuade women who are very fragile and in difficult circumstances to see this as a solution. And I can tell you from many women I know who made this decision and regretted it, they all wake up the next day and know that they did something that they shouldn't have done. And if you think, gosh, Brian, you're being hard on them, you need to be merciful, man, I tell you, love tells the truth. And truth is what gives us the ability to confess. It gives us the ability to repent, to receive the mercy, the grace, and the healing of God. And, you know, to me, the most guilty parties in this are those who push this agenda in such a way as to take care of women and unborn children when they are the most vulnerable, when they should be protected. We're leading them to slaughter. In Leviticus chapter 18, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 20, you say, Brian, give me some proof that abortion is wrong. Well, Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, this is easy. You shall not murder. Murder means to take an innocent life. There could be no more innocent life than the life of the unborn. You may say to me, 
Well, we don't know that that's when life begins. Well, I know that's where it begins. We'll get to that in just a minute. Before he knit us together in our mother's womb, he knew us. In Leviticus chapter 18, verse 21, more specifically, now the Bible didn't talk about in the New Testament or the Old Testament abortion. If they did it, they would have never tried to justify it. But it did talk about offering your children, your infant children, to a, a false god named Moloch. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Moloch. For you must not profane the name of the Lord your God. It's a crime not just against the child, it's a crime against God. I am the Lord. Moloch was a Canaanite god uh, that promised through the blood of a, of a sacrificed child to give a family safety, security, and prosperity. If you were to go into a Planned Parenthood uh, location today, uh, basically the thing they would use to motivate you to have an abortion if you were in difficult circumstances is safety, security, and leaving out the hope that you could have prosperity. It's ultimately the idol of success, the idol of prosperity. And we, in taking something that God meant to be a blessing and calling it a curse. Since 1961, I'm sorry, since 1972, when Roe v. Wade was passed, we've had 61 million children aborted in this country. 61 million children aborted in this country. That means that well over 100 million people do not exist on earth because of those abortions. I wonder what blessings we have not received because we took those blessings and we called them a curse. Many people are up, you know, we, we want to say now that black lives matter, right? And you hear me say every black life matters. If black lives matter, then we should put an end to the abortion industry because 28% of all black lies that are conceived in the womb never see the light of day. As a matter of fact, the founder of Planned Parenthood was a lady named Margaret Sanger. And Margaret Sanger was a racist. And her vision was to put these abortion clinics in neighborhoods in the inner city where people were poor so that in her own words, she could kill the weeds. She was a eugenicist meaning she in some sense was looking for a more perfect breed, only wanting natural selection and those that were born in privilege and those that could, you know, perhaps make contributions and not, not take from society, that they would be the ones that would be born and everyone else would be snuffed out and we would create some kind of perfect race. She was very much influenced by the same people who did these things in Nazi Germany. She was a broken woman, a sinful woman, and I hope she found Christ, but her work on earth was evil. And the legacy that exists through Planned Parenthood in the abortion industry in the United States, the richest nation in the history of the world, where we can have security, safety, and prosperity without taking away our children. This is one of the worst things that we have, we've ever been a part of. In Psalm 127, verse 3, children are a heritage from the Lord, an offspring, a reward from Him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. The Bible says that a man that finds a woman finds favor from God. The Bible seems to say here to me that when a husband and a wife have children or when a husband has a child or when a wife has a child without the other spouse, they not only find favor from God, they find a blessing from God. The beautiful thing about God is that he doesn't you know, commission us to do anything. He doesn't give us the power to do, and that includes being a, president, a, a, a parent. Uh, I often think about how many times I would have gone bankrupt except that God loved my wife and kids so much. That he helps me overcome all my insanity. We think we're poorer because of the children we raise. We're richer because of the children we raise, materially, spiritually, relationally, and in every other way. These children are a blessing. They're not a curse. And to think any other way is to think in a way that is absolutely in inversion to the ways of God. And we need to repent. We need to tell the truth. The kingdom of God is about abundance. It's not about scarcity. The Bible says that through children, we are made stronger. We're not made weaker. When we have opportunities to intermingle with precious people who are going through an unplanned pregnancy by them, but a planned pregnancy by God, we need to love them. We need to counsel them. We need to encourage them. We need to help that life come through, and then we need to support it on the other side. That's what we need to be doing. 
and help them find the blessing and the strength that comes through their ordained office which God has given them even out of difficult circumstances uh, to be parents, to be husbands, to be fathers uh, to be mothers and to be uh, husbands of children for you created my you created my inmost being the psalmist said in Psalm 139 you knit me together in my mother's womb I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. When the psalmist says that he was created in his inmost being and knit together in his mother's womb, he's having a moment with God by which God is giving him supernatural revelation into his creation, into his inception, and he's showing him that he was intended to exist even before he existed. We know that after uh, the, the egg is fertilized by the sperm, we have the intention of God. We have conception. We have some, a, a life or the potential of life to be protected. We know that almost immediately that fertilized egg makes its way to the, the wall of the uterus. When it goes to the wall of the uterus, it embeds itself, and we know that it is, is immediately then charged with blood. At that moment that the blood charges the fertilized egg, we have life. The life is in the blood, according to scriptures. Almost immediately that what we call a fetus begins to take the form of a human body and the doctors tell us that that little body is able to feel peace is able to feel anxiety is able to feel pain and is able to feel comfort the uh, recent statistics i looked at show that that abortions have actually been dropping in america despite this agenda and the reason i think one of the reasons that i think the numbers have been dropping is that through technology women can now see their children and when they when you see it when you see that son when you see that daughter you know that it's life no one can tell you that little baby sucking its thumb in the mother's womb is not life and so a lot of people through that knowledge have made the right decision these are unpleasant truths sometimes but they're truths that need to be told love tells the truth we have to tell the truth and there's a political agenda out there that would take this truth from us and lead us in the wrong direction. And 46% of American Christians in this past election pulled a lever for this. Either out of ignorance or out of apathy or worse than that, out of unbelief. I believe what the liberal left is telling me rather than what the Word of God tells me. And God is saying, you got to wake up. You think I'm comfortable talking about this? No, I'm not comfortable talking about this. You think I get some kind of special pleasure out of standing here and bashing the left wing of our country and their political agenda? I would bash the right wing if they were wrong too. I stand here not as a partisan. I stand here as a man of God. And I'm telling you, almost half the church doesn't have this right. And I really pity us. I really pity us if we exercise our political power or don't exercise our political power based on personal expedience, what's profitable to us, who we're more partisan and friends with rather than the word and the truth of God, I really pity us there. If we're ignorant, we can learn. If we're apathetic, we can wake up. If we're filled with unbelief, we can study the scriptures and ask God to help us to believe. But if we're selfish, we're doomed. If you're a woman that hears my voice today and you've had an abortion, you've, you've not done anything that any of us wouldn't have done under the same circumstances. And I want you to know that God loves you. He's merciful. There's absolute forgiveness for this sin. That we're, we're, we're in a series now called The Seven Deadly Sins. Well, all the sins are deadly, and we would all be dead in our sins without mercy and forgiveness that comes from God. This really isn't aimed at you. This is aimed at the abortion industry. This is aimed at the agenda. And this is aimed at all of us who sit apathetically by and let this happen because of our own expedience. So many of you here in Virginia, I've talked to about these things sometimes, and I see you shut down because you work for the government. You don't want to say anything. You so privatize your faith and your beliefs and your convictions that you've, long, you've ceased to be an American citizen and you instead exist as a slave of the government because you got a good job and good benefits. you got to get over that. What did Jesus say? Unless you lose your life, you won't gain it, but those who hold on to their lives lose it. If you don't believe me, look deeply into the Word. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal these things to you. If you don't have the same convictions as me, that's fine. If you honestly don't believe, uh, come to a place of belief. But I think I'm showing you clearly from Scripture 
what God would have us do. I struggled writing this message this week. I really did. You can probably tell in my delivery that this isn't easy because I know I'm going to lose friends after I say this. I struggle with this also because I don't want to offend and hurt people that God wants me to love and reach out to. I've never been comfortable going to the church where the pastor gets up there and rails on these things and people that have made mistakes go walking out thinking that we're all so self-righteous and nobody loves them. That's why I've steered away from these things. But I feel like God has told me that I haven't changed, but the times have changed, and we've got to begin to talk about these things because now it's not as if people know they made a mistake and need to confess. We actually are beginning to celebrate and take pride in the very things that desecrate us. I also feel like this is an extraordinarily important time in not only our country, but in the life of our little local church here. And it's God's desire to establish us as a body in this community and beyond, according to the vision and the mission that he's given us. And I know from Scripture, I know from all my study, from all the things that God has shown me, that nothing is established apart from righteousness. Nothing. A human life is not established on this earth apart from righteousness. A marriage is not established apart from righteousness. A family is not established apart from righteousness. A church is not established apart from righteousness. A business is not established apart from righteousness. A nation is not established apart from righteousness. The scriptures told us that the thrones in Israel that were established were established through righteousness. Is that perfection, moralistic perfection? No. Righteousness comes through a right relationship with Jesus Christ, first as our Savior, but also as our Lord. Not simply uh, relishing the fact that we've been saved by grace through faith in the work that he did on the cross, but understanding that we experience that salvation in direct proportion to our willingness to bow to our Savior as Lord by grace, through faith, in all of his words, as he said, teach them to obey everything that I've commanded. We will not be established apart from righteousness. We're in this season, this period of repenting from the seven deadly sins because we need to repent. God has great things for us to do, but he's not going to establish us. He's not going to bless us. The church and every member and every family of it apart from righteousness. It doesn't mean we have to be perfect, but it does mean we have to live our life in the light. And we got to tell the truth about the truth. And when we see in a season like this, our country going so far left, so far away from righteousness, we have to speak up. The agenda, the agenda of the Antichrist is among us anti-christian anti-holy spirit anti-god anti-life anti-abundance anti-everything we care about and we got to say something about it love tells the truth as i was preparing uh, to to preach this i was i was standing in this uh place and there was like a um a big wall right in front of me this is a weird story so i hope you get it and there was a big wall right in front of me and it was marble and and i could imagine i, I was e instantly able to imagine that it was probably concrete or brick behind it it was a big thick heavy wall and i had been working on this message and i had been like really wrestling with god do i even preach this do i preach just a part of this do i bring it this hard do i list up you know the, like i did the five things that are wrong with us and just let them have it and stumble through i mean what do i do i was struggling with this and 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 I, this wall was in front of me and for some reason it was bizarre i had this desire to run through the wall and I'm, I'm being quite literal. Like, I had this bizarre desire to drop my briefcase and just go running at the wall as fast as I could. And I knew that it was going to crush me. And I'm like, why do I want... I mean, I really... I mean, I was that close to just running at the wall and getting a black eye and a bloody... I mean, it was... I know that's weird. And I'm like, Lord, why do I want to run at that wall? What is going on? I have never, ever wanted to run right into a brick wall. And the Lord said, well, imagine it. So I imagined it. And I was running as fast as I could right into that wall, boldly knowing I was going to get crushed. I have no idea why. It was, it was like something a dog would do. It was insane. And, and I was running through it, and as I imagined it, I ran right through it. And what I mean is I didn't break through it. I mean I ran right through it because it, wasn't, it was an aberration. It wasn't real. And I felt like the Lord has said, said to me, you know what? Satan has so convinced you and many others that you can't talk about certain things. It's a wall that does not exist. It doesn't exist. And, and there must be something good on the other side because he's trying so hard to keep you from there. 
you got to tell the truth. And America thinks this election is about a mask. It's not about a mask. It's not. I mean, wear your mask, okay? I mean, I don't, but you should. And, and I know 200,000 people have died from coronavirus, and there's some, there's some caveats to that, and I know that's a big deal, and I know it's an issue, and it's appropriate to talk about in this election, but there is nothing, this is nothing like the plague that will be unleashed on this nation if this agenda gets traction. It's nothing. Like the plague that will be released on us if we don't start speaking up for the unborn if we don't protect our children from the sinister agenda that I'm about to, to, to talk to you more about, if we don't stand with Israel, it's, it is nothing compared to that. And you may not like Trump, and you may not like his personality. It's too late to vote for him. Anyway, you vote the way God leads your conscience to vote. I told you, I didn't vote for him in 2016. But I can tell you, if you're pulling the lever for the other side, if you're aligning yourself with that, then you're aligning yourself against God, even if you belong to God. It's unconfessed and unrepented sin. And it can happen actively, but it can also happen passively. We've got to run through the wall and see what's on the other side. The other agenda, this one's very difficult for me to talk about, but I've got to talk about it. And this is the agenda, or this is that this agenda leads to sexual and gender confusion and deviance. What do I mean by that? Well, there's so many things I mean by that. But as is often the case, what the left will do is they'll come to us and they'll say they're trying to protect somebody or something in the form of protection. And so they come to us and they say, well, we want to protect the rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and, tw- and queer Americans plus. Whatever the plus is, is something that's coming next that we don't know. But LGBTQT. Plus, we want to protect them, and we want to protect their rights. They're Americans too. Whether you agree with them or don't agree with them, you need to be tolerant. They have rights. And I, I could not agree with, with that more. I would submit to you that the laws that protect me protect them. The laws that protect us all protect them. We may not need to enumerate extra laws, but if there are laws that we need to pass to protect these Americans, then so be it. Because I have a lot of friends that are gay. I do. I have friends that are gay, and they can't quit being gay and they're struggling with their uh, homosexuality. I have friends that are gay and they don't see anything wrong with it and they're still my friends even though we disagree on that. There's all kinds of, they're tolerant for me being heterosexual. I also have lots of friends, men especially, um, who struggle with their heterosexuality and they fornicate. What that means is simply they sleep with people, many people outside of the context of their marriage. Sexual sin runs rampant, and just because we're struggling with that, we just, you know, it doesn't mean that we're abolished. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a nation left. And so they come to us, and they say they want to protect these Americans, and I couldn't agree more. As a matter of fact, you'll never hear me you know, espouse the need for there to be a constitutional amendment defining marriage. I don't think the government should define marriage. I think the Bible defines marriage, and if the, you know, the establishment clause of the Constitution means anything, it means you go to your church, your spiritual, your faith community, to be married under the authority of God, you don't go to the government. You won't hear me say that. That's something that should be separated. If they don't establish the church, then they don't establish the sacraments of the church, and marriage only has context from Scripture. So you won't hear me saying that either. But it's not just an agenda to protect, it's an agenda to push. To take these ideas to pass them off as natural, to pass them off as even good, to put them into our school systems, to indoctrinate our kids, to confuse our children about their sexuality and about their gender, and then, as you're about to hear, to empower them to do something about it when they don't have the maturity or the understanding to do so. It's not just protection, it's pushing an agenda, it's confusing and it leads to destruction and is aimed at, ladies and gentlemen, 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 through our media and through our education at our children. It's aimed at our children. Luke 17, Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are, are bound to come, but woe, woe, a curse upon anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown out into the sea with a millstone around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If you pulled the lever for Joe Biden and he becomes president 
And God forbid one seat in the Senate changes and it's 50-50 and Kamala Harris is the tie-breaking vote. He has promised in the first 100 days, this is, this is fact and it is now, he has promised in the first 100 days to pass something called the Equality Act, which w among many sinister things under that seemingly innocent title would give an eight-year-old boy that thinks he's a girl or an eight-year-old girl who thinks they're a boy access to medical care that will augment their body, their biological development for the rest of their lives and they will usurp the authority of parents to do it. That's right now. That's the threat that, that lies on our children. So it's not just protecting the rights of those. It's pushing the agenda. You get them in school, you confuse them, and then you give them power through the government around their parents to make decisions that will destroy them. Could there be anything more evil? Would you have any respect for me if I didn't stand here and tell you about that? It's terrible. It's wrong. And you know it. I know you know it. And some of you are like, man, I wish you'd have preached this sermon a long time ago. Other people are like, wow, I never knew all this. Some of you hate my guts right now. We're, we're all over the place. But remember, I work for him. I don't work for you. And if we're going to establish this thing and do this thing, and I'm going to be a blessing to you to serve you, it's only the truth that sets us free. A very prominent pastor, I'm not going to use his name, but one that you probably all would know, I have a lot of respect for, a lot of respect for. Before the election came out and said that he wouldn't vote for, for Trump and he wouldn't vote for Biden, he wouldn't vote for either one, he wasn't going to vote for anybody which is his prerogative, but he basically said Christians shouldn't vote for anybody because, you know, one is vain and one has got this anti-Christian agenda. And so I guess, I guess he just went up into his ivory tower of theology and just rose above it all. And we'll just let the unwashed, unwashed masses, you know, perish in this sinister agenda because we don't know the difference between an unpleasant tweet and a satanic agenda. I mean, do what you want before God. You don't have to answer to me. You answer to him. If I did this wrong, I'd be answering to him all week. But come on. This is at hand. If the Republicans in the state of Georgia, if this election holds and the Republicans in the state of Georgia don't sign up, this thing will become law, and I don't trust the Supreme Court to strike down anything, and, and children will perish. They'll be confused and taken away from God forever because we didn't speak up. And there's nothing honorable about me doing this today. I probably should have done it a month ago, but I didn't have the guts. God had to wait till after the election to get me to this point. Overall, all of these, by the way, there's so many more things I could talk about. I could talk about socialism, by the way, which is the economic system that brings along communism. And communism, or Marxism, is entirely based on atheism because in that system there can be no God. The government is God. We could talk about the disintegration of families. We could talk about this sinister agenda they call a global reset where the global elites are trying to reset and create a new world order that is going to take us nothing but away from God in ways that I can tangibly show. I don't have that kind of time to talk about all those things. I just, I'm going to talk about three things uh, as I just did and I'm going to tell you overall um, these are crimes against creation, humanity and families. If you were here during the Genesis series, you, you heard me say that there are basic, th three basic elements to a, the covenant with God. In the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, in the middle, in the promised land, and again when Christ returns and we live in the new Eden for all eternity. The three basic elements of a covenant relationship with God among his people is God himself, man, humanity, and land. Living under the covering of God, under the authority of God, with the blessings and the power of God, creativity, energy, peace, and joy. Those are the features for the purpose of glorifying God and Him enjoying us and us enjoying Him and all of us enjoying and loving each other forever. That's kind of the basics of the covenant. Well, that's the covenant, that's the creation that Satan has warred against from the beginning. In Genesis 1, 26, it said, Then God said, this is during creation, this was His original intention. All of this is a rejection of the authority of God who is the author of all creation. Then God said, let us make... Mankind in our image. This was God's desire in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over the livestock, and all the wild animals 
and all the creatures that move along the, gra- the ground. Our authority comes through the image of God, which is the authority of God, which is the spirit of God that lives inside of us. Satan came and he deceived us. And where we once had real glory and real power, we've had that stripped and it's been replaced with pride and vanity instead. It's a crime against humanity. It's a crime against God. It's a crime against even family. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them without confusion. Sexually pure. Without deviance, without confusion. We knew in the beginning that we were men, and we knew in the beginning we were women, and we were happy about it. We knew love, we knew faithfulness, we knew fidelity. We couldn't wait to have children. We considered them a blessing and not a curse. That was the way it was meant to be. As you can see, everything I talked about today is an inversion, a perversion of all that. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over every living creature that moves on the ground. He blessed them. And he said, Be fruitful and increase. Children were a blessing from the beginning to increase the authority and the glory of God and we've seen it as completely the opposite thing not us of course but others and on our watch this doctrine is indoctrinating masses of people and we haven't we have not well spoken up but maybe now maybe now is our time love tells the truth truth gives us the opportunity to confess our sins to God and to be forgiven to be washed clean truth gives us the capacity after we've been washed in the blood of jesus christ to be filled with the holy spirit and to hear and to know and to follow his word to the exclusion of any other voice the good news is what satan and what we ourselves have desecrated god comes to redeem by grace through faith in his words but then that means we also must have the courage to stand firm and tell the truth Uh, in nazi germany way back in the day the lutheran church or the protestant church in germany they had this separation of church and state kind of doctrine among them and they felt like God had given the church a certain authority and a certain anointing and they they felt like God had given a separate anointing and authority to the government and they felt like their job as the church was not to tell truth to power or to mess too much with the government to keep these things very separate very much the way we do in America today well because of that when Hitler came on the scene and the things that he espoused and even sometimes called Christian were not held into account a great number of people were deceived even many in the church the elect were deceived by his ungodly anti-godly unchristian anti-christian agenda one that was violent one that hated Jews rather than blessing Jews you know the whole story and Dietrich Bonhoeffer was mortified by this mistake of the church He escaped Germany and came to the United States. He became a professor at Union Seminary in New York City. And after he got there, after a very short period of time, he came under conviction that he didn't need to be hiding over here. He needed to go back over there and try to fix what was broken. And so he went over there to save the lives of Jews and to undermine the government. And he he did it with a deep conviction that the church had failed because it failed to tell truth to power. It stood there silently. This, This quote is attributed to him. Nobody's sure if he really said it but he certainly lived and died by these convictions the quote says this silence in the face of evil is evil itself and God will not hold us guiltless not to speak is to speak not to act is to act what did Jesus say? Matthew chapter 5 you're the salt of the earth the preservative of civilization as Paul would say in Thessalonians the restrainer of evil You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. In Matthew chapter 24, the Lord shows us. We we did this with the, the Every Black Lives Matter message. The Lord showed us how to take our stand against evil. We stand firm in truth, which is also to stand firm in love. We tell the truth, knowing that Christ one day will come and vindicate the truth. When that puts us in peril, we flee, but we keep telling the truth, and we wait for the day for him to come and to redeem us. We stand firm, and we continue to tell the truth, and we do it in love, and we do it regardless of persecution. 
Uh, we exist in a place where there's very little chance that we're going to be violently persecuted, although I guess that could change. And we stand firm till the end. That's the command that God has given us. We are the restrainers of evil. If this place becomes Babylon, it'll be because of us. It'll be because we went to sleep. Either we were ignorant, or we were apathetic, or we were unbelieving, or we were asleep. And so I think God comes to us today, and he opens our eyes, and he tells us these things, and he tells us many other things, and he says, hey, there's something you need to do. There's a response to be made. Your preacher just preached it. What are you going to do? The ball's now in your court. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for days like these where we don't just have a polished worship service where we say all the right things and hit all the right platitudes, where we look deeply into your word as looking into a mirror that reflects back upon us and we examine our minds and we examine our hearts, we examine our actions and our inactions, our words, the things we say and the things that we should have done and said that we did not do and say. And we come to a place of repentance. You've shown us, dear God, that nothing is established apart from righteousness. It's not about um, all the things we do to grow a church and to be successful. It's about a right relationship with you, where we come to you humbly through the cross, receive forgiveness for our sins, specifically what they are, and are filled with your Holy Spirit. I pray, dear God, that you would demolish all the arguments and every pretension that exalts itself above your knowledge. I pray that you would demolish the satanic agenda coming from the left wing of our nation. I pray that you would expose it, that you would correct it, and that you would prevent it. I pray that you would indeed restrain this evil and save our lives. I pray that you would give each and every one of us a conviction for action. What we're to say, what we're to do, what we're responsible for before you. We thank you and praise you that we live in a nation where we have the freedom of speech, we have the freedom of religion, we have the freedom to gather. I thank you and praise you that you have shown us that these rights are not just freedoms, they're not luxuries, but they're also responsibilities. I pray that we'd use them wisely as stewards before you to bring you glory and to bring people into the knowledge of your love, of your grace, and your truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.